and uh, he's come back from Iraq, Fallujah, and you know, like many of these guys, he gets a job, uh, he doesn't want to work, an office job, he gets a job working for one of the attorneys down uh, downtown doing investigative work, and he also takes side jobs where he takes uh, a percentage of what he finds, hence the title, The Cut. But the original title of this book was A Walk in the Night, and you will see why in a minute. Um, and he likes to bike around town, he likes to take walks at night, and he's just woken up from a, uh, from a dream about his deceased father, which is a little bit prophetic, and he decides to go for a walk. He lives in 16th Street Heights, and he heads towards Fort Stevens. And um, I always try to uh, experience what I'm writing about, so I took this walk myself one night, and I ended up on the, uh, across Fort Stevens at night, and I ended up on the side lot of the Emory Methodist Church on Georgia, which is just a block away from the 4th District Police Station. But it's a good place to kill a person because the parking lot is elevated and you can't see down to Georgia and, and the people in Georgia can't see up what's going on in, in the lot at night. And as Hitchcock once said, it's very hard to kill a man. And you'll see uh, where this goes. Unbeknownst to him, there's somebody following him. And it's a kind of a creepy guy wears a uh, wooden cross of crucifix out on his shirt, sort of like Strother Martin in The Wild Bunch, if you remember that character. Anyway, here we go. <laughs> Lucas stood. He felt like having a beer, but he didn't want to drink alone. The bar up on Georgia was as good as any. He brushed his teeth, washed his face, and came back out to the living room. He reached for the keys to his Jeep, but picked up only his house key instead. It was a nice night. He decided to walk. Lucas walked north on Piney Branch Road. It was not the same thoroughfare known by commuters, but more like the urban alley version of a country lane. He could hear cars moving to the west of him on 16th Street, but it was quiet back here tonight. A big engine moved somewhere behind him, and he turned his head and saw a flash of a black vehicle on a cross street, and he kept moving his feet. He crossed Gallatin, then Hamilton, and made a ride right on the wide and majestic Colorado Avenue and headed northeast. Then he was in the small commercial district at 14th and Colorado. He walked by the Gold Corner Grocery where he often bought beer, Louis Barbershop, Colorado Cafe, Fluorescence Beauty Salon, and the Ethiopian market called Nikitas. He didn't have to look to recognize the business names because he knew them by heart. Many people, mostly black and Hispanics, were out. He walked by the beautifully maintained Longfellow Apartments with their center screen porches and iron balconies, and a man who smelled of alcohol walked towards him and said, Hola, and Lucas said, Hola, como esta, because that was nearly all the Spanish he knew. At 13th Street, he walked due north and crossed at the Missouri Avenue light. He approached Quackenbow Street, where he cut right as he often did, and began to walk across the dark, weeded field of Fort Stevens Park. To his left stood the historic fort, the trenches, ammunition bunkers, cannons, and a flagpole. He stayed to the field and arrived at a gravel driveway that led up to the parking lot that sat between the Methodist Church and a four-square colonial with a wraparound porch, which was also church property and unlit behind its windows. Lucas often cut through the lot and descended the steep concrete steps that dropped down to Georgia Avenue. He passed a bucket truck and construction materials and went up a rise and came to the lot, lit faintly by a lamp hung on the side of the stone church. In the lot stood a man. <laughs> Lucas stopped 50 feet shy of the man and studied him. His face seemed flat and his eyes were set wide. His skin in spots was devoid of color. His hair was lank. He wore jeans and a t-shirt rolled up at the sleeves to show thickly veined biceps. He was a small man, but he was strong and wired tight. Lucas worked towards him. The lot empty of cars was so greatly elevated that it was not visible from the heavily trafficked Georgia Avenue. 
Behind them was the darkness of the field. The man must have spied Lucas walking into the park and correctly surmised that there was but one way to the avenue. He had left his vehicle down in Georgia, taken the steps up, and waited for him there. He did not look like he had come to talk. What is this, said Lucas, approaching the man. The man said nothing, and as Lucas neared him, he reached into his left hand pocket and produced a knife. With a jerk of his wrist, a six-inch serrated blade sprung from its bone hilt. He held it loosely and correctly, palm up. Now Lucas was just a couple of yards away from the man. They stood in the center of the lot. It was like a basketball court where they had come to jump for possession, or the center circle of a wrestling mat. You know your Bible, said the man. Lucas did not answer. He stayed focused on the man's lidless eyes. John 11.10 But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Not this man, said Lucas. They moved at the same time. The man swung the knife and Lucas stepped out of it and back. He swung again. His reach was not sufficient, and Lucas knew that he would have to come in. The man flipped the knife, switched it to a down grip, and he brought it across from his right shoulder as if he were swinging it back. He caught only air. He brought the blade back from the other direction and swung with a grunt, and it took him too far. Lucas stepped to the side and came in quickly. He grabbed the man's wrist and whipped his open palm with a hammer blow at the knife arms over. The man's hand opened like a stunned flower, sending the knife skittering across the asphalt. Lucas pushed him away. The man looked at the knife ten feet from his reach. He thought about it, and Lucas said, You had your chance. Thank you.